squash. To most people, it's a vegetable. But to the subject of our interview today, it's actually the way he makes his living. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the Sports Wire. We have a very special guest interview for you today. It's the winningest coach in college sports history, Coach Paul Asante from the Trinity College squash team. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for uh, granting me the interview. And um, well, tell us a little bit about the game of squash, because uh, well, to most people it's only a vegetable. Right, exactly. Well, it's interesting, you know, being the winningest coach in college sports history, of an obscure sport like squash, you know, it's a little bit like being the tallest midget at the circus. Nobody really, you know, pays much attention. But uh, squash is a game that's very big in, around the world, and it's certainly getting bigger in the United States. Um, it's been, it was started off as an English sport, so the countries typically that were big in that were India, Pakistan, England, Australia, uh, France. Now it's very big in Egypt. It's big in Latin America, and um, and I'm happy to announce it's starting to get really a lot stronger in the United States. Great. Um, it's essentially a four-wall court game, mm -hmm. so the analogy would be it's sort of like racquetball. Um, and I would say that racquetball is to squash as checkers is to chess. Okay. You know, they basically played on the same field. Mm -hmm. It's just that one has a lot more movement and a lot more complexity to it. Okay. So what would be the what would be a typical squash match compared to a racquetball match? Well, it's interesting when you first the beauty of racquetball is two people can come and play right off the street and immediately get a good workout because mm -hmm. the ball's bouncy, uh, the ceiling is in play, and so there's a great sense of satisfaction right away. Mm -hmm. In squash, the ball is pretty dead, okay. and so the first few times you play squash, it's very frustrating and it's hard to get the game going. But then there's a funny thing that happens: there's a shift. So that in squash, as you get better, the rallies get longer. And in racquetball, as you get better, the rallies get shorter. So at the world-class level, racquetball rallies last about two hits. Okay. And in squash, at the world-class level, rallies could last 180 hits. Wow. So you have two people out there really killing each other. Wow, very good. For, uh, for college students that graduate, is there a pro league that's going to be starting in the U.S. anytime soon? Or well, is there, there, is a, there is a pro oh, okay. tour. It's played all around the world. You met Chris yeah. Binney from uh, Jamaica. He's playing the pro tour. Okay. Um, there is some money to be paid. Typically, they're, the people playing the pro tour are also, um, you know, have a part-time job or getting the master's degree or working at a country club, you know, that sort of thing. I just came back from the uh, world championships where I'm – the USA coach. Yep. And uh, it was in France. And, um, you know, there were 132 players there. It was the men's world championships. And, you know, the standard was very high. Each country had four players on it. It's, uh, it's, it's a big deal. All right. So let's uh, rewind a little bit. And let's, uh, how did you get started in squash? Uh, my, my whole life has been bass ackers, really. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I went to West Point um, after graduating from college to be the assistant gymnastics coach. Okay. And uh, got there to find out that these were enlisted spots. Okay. So all of a sudden, I'm going off to Fort Dix, New Jersey for basic training, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. I went to college, so I didn't have to go into the <laughs> Army, you know? And uh, so I was up at West Point training for the, you know, Pan American team and that sort of thing, and I got hurt. Okay. And so I figured I needed to do something different. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll pick up tennis. Mm -hmm. And I picked up tennis the way I was doing gymnastics, which was seven hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. So you can get pretty good at tennis pretty fast, yep. uh, at least compared to gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So at that point in time, the tennis coach, who was a world-class tennis coach, Davis Cup, the whole thing, quit. And I applied for the job, and I had no right getting that job. <laughs> They offered it to seven other people, all of whom turned it down. 
because it involved, you know, PT runs at five in the morning with cadets. And so they said, oh, God, we got to give it to this guy. Mm -hmm. So they gave me the job for one year, and they took me downstairs to the squash courts. I didn't even know they were in the building. Oh, wow. And they said, and now you're the head squash coach. <laughs> and that's how my career started. Wow. So from West Point, then you went to? I went to a country club and played professionally, and I've been doing this now 40 years. Wow. Still trying to figure out how to do it right, and uh, and so yeah, my my entry into the world of squash is very very backwards. All right. Well, obviously you've done something right, coming off a 13 consecutive winning, 13 consecutive undisputed season, and 13 consecutive national championships in the squash from '98 until 2012. Right. Correct. And and then um, what happened to break it? Well, we lost to Yale in our dual match, okay. which ended the streak mm -hmm. at 252, I think. Mm -hmm. And then we lost the national championships at Princeton. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was a great match, and I was really happy for my colleague, the Princeton coach. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy. And then last year, we came back and retook the national championship, mm -hmm. which to me was the coolest thing ever, because my dream was always that I knew we were going to lose at some point. Uh, but I didn't want us to just fade away into blackness. Right. I wanted us to remain compelling. And then to come back and take the championship back, that was the coolest thing ever. So for basically 14 championships in 15 years, yep. um, you must have, obviously, since college is only four years, you have to have great turnover. Yep. So how is it that the seniors pass it on to the juniors that quickly? And, and you know, the freshmen coming through? And, yep. Well, we run this, I think it's from my years at West Point. Well, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in, in running this like a family. And um, everybody belongs to this family. On the first day of practice, I tell the freshmen, you know, these are your brothers. And you've got to have their back and they're going to have yours. And I'm a big believer in seniority and the rite of passage. I, I like the upperclassmen to run, run the program as much as we can. Um, we make sure the freshmen understand that they're the lowest form of life on earth. Even if they're the best player on the team, mm -hmm. um, they still have the right of passage to go through. So it's all about the tradition in the family. And, uh, and these boys take that very seriously. Okay. And the family is truly a family. I mean, we, we exchange emails every day with the team. And, you know, we sign them off as, I love you, man. Mm -hmm. you know, the guys know that I love them. And um, the alums stay very connected. We had a boy on the team, his father passed away. And that weekend, we had 30 alums from around the world to come back to make sure wow. he was okay. So we really do run it like a family. We, we do not emphasize the individual accomplishments at all, mm -hmm. even though it's pretty much an individual sport. Okay. We treat it purely as a team experience. That's how we focus on it. And, mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be the formula that's been able to keep us near the top. Also, the college has been very supportive uh, of what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've earned that support because we're bringing in exceptional student athletes. Our, okay. gra our graduation rate's 100%. Great. Right. You know, so yeah, it's it's a very nice uh, formula and, and it works. Okay, great. Speaking of uh, tradition, I noticed that uh, here at Trinity you had the tennis courts named after. Yeah. <laughs> How ironic that, you know, you started in tennis, you know, converted to squash, and now it's the tennis courts that's named after you. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I am also the tennis coach here. Oh, okay. And the center squash court, um, they also wanted to name after me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I deflected that, and we named it after my father. Oh, really? So court number five is the Paul Asiente court, my father's name. Okay. So... You know, I, as I tell people, if you live long enough, those things come your way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't put a lot of a lot of stock in them. Okay. Uh, so you you did write a book, so you're an author. You uh, right. wrote Run to the Roar. Right. It's a great book. I recommend anybody go out and get it. Thank you. Um, it tells about your life and it parallels squash. So how did how did your life for the viewers that haven't read it? How did your life parallel the game of squash? Well, there are three themes in the book. Um, the first theme is learning how to manage fear. Mm -hmm. And that's where the title Run to the Roar comes from, basically going right at the problem. Mm -hmm. Most people will avoid conflict at any cost. The second theme of the book is um, 
the value of life lessons that you learn on athletic fields. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful quote from MacArthur at West Point, and it says, on the friendly fields of strife are sown the seeds that in later fields will bear the fruits of victory. Mm -hmm. Which, what I always took that to mean, was you learn about yourself on athletic fields. So mm -hmm. we wrote, wrote about that, but everybody's done that. Um, and then the third theme of the book was, uh, it's an apology to my three children. Okay. I really wasn't there for my children when they were growing up. I was too busy trying to win national championships and be the winningest coach and have rings and banners. And all of those things happened, but so what? Mm -hmm. So I felt like I, my children deserved to hear that I was sorry and, okay. that, um, and that they, they deserved a little better. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that because I thought that there are a lot of people in this world that are striving that should spend a little more time focusing on their families. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, I do quite a, a bit of public speaking as a part of the book tour. And, um, you know, this is exactly what they want to know about. Yeah. You know, life, work, balance, having the proper priorities. You know, the big boys on Wall Street that are banging down, you know, millions and millions of dollars are not going home to play catch with junk. Right. But they should be. That's, mm -hmm. that's really the big scoreboard in the sky. You're right. That's so right. that's where the uh, book came in. It took eight years to write the book. Okay. Um, it morphed into many different iterations. Mm -hmm. We were going to make it a how-to book. Who the hell would buy a book on squash how-to? <laughs> then we were going to make it the second coming of uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not a businessman, so that wasn't going to work. So we finally it finally morphed into this. Okay. And then the crazy thing is... In, Two weeks ago, we signed. I signed away the life rights to my book. Okay. So it's now going to be made into a movie. That's and, fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's it's hard for me to get my brain around that. You know, it's I can't imagine it, but it would be pretty cool because it would essentially be the first movie made with the preponderance of the theme being around the game of squash. It'd be Great. very good for the game. Absolutely. Uh, so. Just uh, out of the blue, if you were to choose who was going to play you, who would that be? Well, I, I always joke that it's going to be Pee Wee Herman, but um, it's hard to tell. I don't. They, there's rumor that they've been talking to Tom Hanks. I don't know who's going to be me. Okay. Uh, do you, were you have any hand in the production or not? Well, it's a little frightening, to be honest with you. Um, in writing a book, you have some control over how the characters in the book are, are portrayed. Mm -hmm. And obviously in this book, my son Matthew has had a bumpy road. Mm -hmm. And so I thought in the book we, we touched on his challenges with some dignity. Okay. When you sign away a lot your life rights, mm -hmm. you don't know what the movie producers are going to do. Right. So I hope to have some say in the process, mm -hmm. but it also frightens the hell out of me because I just don't really know how salacious, you know, the movie producers are going to want to sell this thing. And so exactly. they're going to need to make it as juicy as they can, and I don't mm -hmm. want it to be juicy at the expense of my family. I don't blame them. That's, that's great. All right, so uh, so tell us a little bit about a typical day when you have your tournaments and you have your game matches. Tell us about a typical day in your life getting ready for a squash match. So basically the way, you know, we, the way we prepare for, on game day is it's pretty much like every other day. Um, my job on game day is to make sure the boys are calm. Mm -hmm. So they come in and they work it in the mor work out in the morning to get rid of their nerves, mm -hmm. and then the whole idea is to keep them calm. Um, a year ago, I got to speak to the Patriots. Belichick called me up and asked me if I would come up and speak to the team, and uh, that was really cool. You know, you don't bump into boys like that in the mall. Mm -hmm. Wolf Fork is 6'3", 360, and I saw him stuff the football over the goalpost. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And we were talking about it. We were texting after the Hall of Fame induction. And I said, you know, the thing we will all miss the most, and this is, if you ask any coach, you ask Calhoun what he misses the most, they'll tell you it's practice. Practice is our workshop. It's, it's where we're safe. Um, there's no press. There's no newspapers. It's just you and the boys. And um, that's the beauty of it. The day of the match is not as much fun for me. Um, I know that when I think back to my competing days, I don't remember the competitions. I remember the, pre the preparation, and it was it was joyous. It's funny when when people ask me when you look back on the national championships, what do you remember? 
I always remember the breakfast on the day of the finals. Really? Where people are sitting around trying to act calm <laughs> and trying to act like they're really enjoying breakfast, but really their you know, their hearts are in their mouths. Mm -hmm. They're not enjoying anything. <laughs> and we're just trying to keep it light and calm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so moving over to a little bit of uh, current culture, current event, uh, obviously in baseball there's this huge thing about PEDs. Two questions. First off is, are there any PED problems in squash? Or have you found out of anybody trying to do something to get ahead? Well, they are drug tested in squash. Okay. At the World Championships, we everybody was drug tested. Um, you people fail test the drug tests more for social drugs than they do the okay. in, improvement drugs. But um, I would say that at this juncture, the game is a little bit behind tennis in that regard. Okay. We're beginning to see some some of that in the game of tennis. Mm -hmm. In the game of tennis now, people are getting so big and so strong. It's all about power. With squash, it's more about movement. So you know, you're not going to see doping and that sort of thing mm -hmm. at the same level. My guess is we'll probably get there. Okay. Um, the PEDs and everything have everything to do with money. It's all about money. And the risks are worth it. You know, you get banned for a year and you lose $3 million. And the next year you're signing a $26 million contract. So where's the disincentive? Right. You know, that isn't there. In squash, there isn't that kind of money. So we're not seeing it yet. Okay. I suspect we probably will. Okay. Um, so if somebody was, uh, my, well, my second question about the PEDs is, do you follow all sports besides just squash? Oh, I'm the biggest couch potato in the world. <laughs> right? My favorite thing is when we go to the Pan American Games, mm -hmm. you know, where every sport is being played. Okay. And I'll go and watch all the other sports. Just really I love it. It's the coolest thing. Great. Um, so how do you feel about Alex Rodriguez and, you know, the situation where Major League Baseball wants to ban him for 211 games? Uh, how do you feel? Too harsh? Not severe enough? Well, you know, I'm an educator. Okay. I'm in the business of teaching. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for instance, in modern society, there are many, many people who think marijuana should be legal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're in a college setting, you know these boys are going to see it out there all the time. Mm -hmm. But my job is to say, guys, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. One of the things I feel strongly about with A-Rod is we're in a, we live in a very forgiving society. Mm -hmm. If you own your mistakes, if you get right up and say, gee, I, I'm sorry, I, I made a terrible decision here, and I, I, I apologize, and I, I do my best not to make that kind of a mistake again, the world is going to forgive you. Um, this guy that um, plays for the Eagles, who came out with all those racial slurs? Mm -hmm. He owned it immediately. Right. Now, he's going to have a hard time having his teammates accept him back into the locker room. But the Eagles fans are going to get past that. Mm -hmm. A Rod and Braun mm -hmm. lied to the public. Right. They Braun didn't. I mean, Braun threw that testing guy under the under, under the, the train. Bus. Yeah. I mean, you know, he should have just got up and said, "Yeah, I'm sorry. I did this." Take your punishment and move on. Mm -hmm. So in the case of A-Rod, but again, it comes down to money. So many people have so much to lose, the whole A-Rod team. I would have liked for him to step up and say, I blew it. I made a mistake here. Um, I'm going to take my ban, whatever mm -hmm. it is. My guess is that he's going to you know, protest the ban and he's going to have it reduced. Yep. And then he'll be back. I mean, he played baseball last night. Yeah. That's crazy. But the system, you know, we have this, this litigious society. Right. So I, I, as an educator, I feel badly for the young people to have to watch this. Mm -hmm. And I am a big fan, and I, we talk about it all the time. Own, own, own it all. Mm -hmm. If you're a national champion, you want to own that feeling of, of pride. Right. Well, when you make a human mistake, you should own that too. Great. All right. Well, Coach, I want to thank you for no, your time. Um, it's been great. I wish you the best of luck for this upcoming season. Well, luck will factor in. How do, how do you see this upcoming season? Do you not know the majority of your team? Um, it's going to be a tough season. Um, Harvard, a bunch of the schools have really ratcheted up. Mm -hmm. 
they're doing a much uh, more aggressive recruiting job. Okay. And um, you know the the product that they're selling is pretty pretty prime. Mm -hmm. So I think that the competition is going to be very intense this year. I hope that we will remain competitive. Mm -hmm. I hope that we'll remain competitive for a long time to come. <laughs> but I just don't know. So the majority of the schools that you play are they the Ivy League? School? Oh sure. I was laughing about it the other day when I when we won our first. When we made it to the finals of our first national championship, you play in a tournament where there are you know, maybe 80 teams. Right. But you're broken into groups of four. Mm -hmm. Or I apologize, in, in, into groups of eight. Okay. And that's a product of the whole season. So you're ranked one through eight, then you're ranked nine through 16. So, so we played in the one through eight bracket. We were the only team in that tournament, in that group of eight, that was not an Ivy League school. Wow. So it's been completely dominated by the Ivies. My guess this year is there may only be two, possibly three, Ivy League teams in the top eight. Really? So the whole thing has changed. Wow. And we've democratized the sport. So who's um, who's been your biggest rival? Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. Okay. We've had some bloody wars with Rochester. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Lawrence is getting really good. Franklin and Marshall. I mean, it's it's a wild... Wild West now. Great. All right. Well, I'd like to thank I you again. I appreciate it. Thank you for and, your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your season, the rest of your summer off. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, thanks. I want to thank you viewers for watching. And uh, definitely check us out. And I will uh, check out Trinity Swatch coming up. Uh, yeah. Help make you, the game a little bigger. Go to YouTube and type in uh, Trinity Swatch. All right, folks. Thank you very much for tuning in. I want to thank Coach Paul Ashante from the Trinity College squash team, uh, and definitely run out to wherever you're going to buy books, whether it's an ebook or not. Definitely pick up his book, Run to the Roar. It is an awesome book. I highly recommend it. And also look in the future for his for the movie to come out that's based on the book.